Welcome to the dark forest. Jackie and her pals will never bore us. Shameless confessions about our obsession will make us laugh and smile. So let's explore the dark forest and dark down for a while. Hi, I'm Jackie Cation. You are about to listen to the dark forest. Let's give you the info about it. First of all, you know the websites. Dorkforest.com, thedorkforest.com, if you like a determiner, jackiecation.com has everything. All of my podcasts, including uh, videos of my stand-up, my stand-up schedule, merchandise you can purchase if you would like, and a lot more info than you possibly even need. Let's do the credits. Mike Rickberg sang and produced and composed that song at the beginning of the show. He sang with his wife, Sarah. It's very beautiful. At the end of the program, he sings his version of the Mexican hat dance. That's Mike Rickberg. Vilmos fixes JackieCation.com. He is uh, the web designer over there. And Patrick Brady fixes the audio. And in this case, there's a video intro. Very exciting. Anyway, those are the websites. If you want to support the show, you're doing it already by listening to it or watching it. And another way is to tell your friends and family, go on iTunes, do a review. Another way is to just give me money. Yeah. You could use the donate button. You can make it even monthly if you're okay with making things monthly. You do a PayPal monthly. There's a monthly choice on PayPal. The PayPal is a button on the Jackie Cation or the Dork Forest website, and it goes directly to me. Thank you very much. I will use it wisely or foolishly. Your call as well. Now, my email address, Jackie at JackieCation.com, is where you can contact me if you have any questions or concerns and about the Dork Forest. And I do have a Venmo account. It's Jackie hyphen Cation, oddly enough. Another way to support the show is on DorkForest.com and JackieCation.com. There's an Amazon link. And the Amazon link just takes you to Amazon. You order like normal, and it supports the show because you came from Jackie Cation or DorkForest.com. Very exciting. Other than that, oh, there are there is a band camp. You can if you have listened to all the episodes that are free and you need more content, there are several live episodes that are at the dorkforest.bandcamp.com. And those cost me a couple of bucks, so I charge a couple of bucks. There's also a storytelling album there that you can listen to some stories that I did live. And there are 17 free episodes before The Dork Forest was pre-recorded. So the audio isn't very good, but the guests were super funny and fun and dorky. So if you want to do that, go to the thedorkforest.bandcamp.com. Other than that, let's see if there are other things that I should be talking about. Possibly uh, the merch. Yeah, if you want to buy merch. The only other thing I want to talk about is the merch. You can get Dork Forest t-shirts uh, and you can get stand-up comedy t-shirts. You can get my albums or my DVD over at JackieCation.com slash merch. There's pins, there's a challenge coin, there's a bunch of new things happening over there. Anyway, a lot of information. I think, I don't think I've missed anything, but who cares? Let's get into the show. Hey, it's Jackie Cation. I'm talking to... Uh, Almost everybody's at Flappers, you guys, this uh, this month. <laughs> this month, it's Flappers. I'm with Josh Schneider, uh, who is at Nerdy Virgin. We could talk about that for an hour, but let's not. That's between you and your God, and I'm happy that you're cool with it. You are both a nerd. Welcome to the Dork Forest. Uh, and at one time, we're a virgin, if I, if I uh, when you set it up. Um, Correct. There you go. And uh, so Josh Schneider, you guys, he's the booker over at uh, Flappers. So always a good reason to keep someone... On your good side, if you're a stand-up comic, such a jackass comic. Can, can I just say I'm always terrified because I listen to your the Jackie and Lori show, and I'm always terrified that I'm one of the names that you write down to show each other. Josh Schneider, <laughs> your handle is Nerdy Virgin. Uh, you are fine. Uh, you. <laughs> are incredibly supportive you have never been written down though it's very funny that the only people who care about that are like the nicest guys in the world dan telfer he's like i just never want to be written down and you're like dan it's not gonna be you you're a guy that tries real hard and uh you too josh so uh do you want to change your name so that it reflects uh your name oh what the heck uh, right yeah i probably should do that yeah I'm going to change my name so it reflects my Venmo. Why don't you do that? What? 
I know. Just so much riffing. Um, Which is, yeah, my Venmo is also Nerdy Virgin. Oh, there you go. Hey, no, don't be shy, you guys. Everybody, we're all just trying to work for a little. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, all right. So here we are with Josh Schneider, and um, you, yeah, so you're the Booker at Flapper, so you're, you guys are doing shows right now. Yes. Until it's uh, safe to have brick and mortar shows, you guys are doing uh, Zoom shows and virtual shows. Correct. Seven nights a week uh, with, uh, we're trying to, you know, I think my, our goal right now is really to get as many comedians who want to do Zoom shows as possible, you know, opportunities to do the Zoom shows. Yeah, just to get and, stage time. And, and also, weirdly, to really start to think about it as a second club that we, you know, we need to start building awareness of it. Because unlike, you know, the physical club, anyone on earth can buy a ticket to see the show. So then the question is, how do you market to the world in, when you have no budget? Right, right, right. Well, and the interesting thing is, is that there are so many people who are like, you know, I live in the middle of Canada. I am in Norway. You're not coming. Uh, but these are great, but I've heard your album. I'm interested in, you know, I love stand-up comedy. I'd love to see stand-up comedy. So, you know, Rangers, this is, this is a chance to see some of the best comics. And the thing about Los Angeles stand-up comedy is that it's every, and I've said it a thousand times, but every four months I meet 10 new comics who have just moved here from the Boons and four of them are amazing. And, uh, and they're up. And you're just like, and I, and I've repeatedly said, why aren't you famous? At which point they've said to me, why aren't you? So that's how that <laughs> conversation goes. But let's, uh, yeah, let's get into your dorkdom, which I think All is right. interesting, which is okay. movie soundtracks. I've heard of the John Williams guy. He's, he's a famous guy. Okay. So let, let, uh, we're, uh, this, uh, I want to start by asking you a question. Okay. Um, first of all, are you more of a sci-fi or a, more of a fantasy person? Um, you had to pick one. If I in movies or fil- or books, movies. Um, I would say sci-fi. Sci-fi. Okay. Uh, name the first sci-fi movie that comes to your mind. Okay. Uh, Contact. Contact. Da 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 da. It's gonna be a game show. It's gonna be like this, you guys. <laughs> Who wrote that? Uh, that would be Alan Silvestri, who also did Back to the Future. Ba 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 da 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 da. I gotta be careful. I'm. You I'm can't put about singing. Yeah, you can't put too much. YouTube will just cut it all out. That's what I was gonna say. That's <laughs> that's actually happened to me on clips. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to. Yeah, I don't know how so, to make sure that you're only doing what three seconds of each. I don't even understand what that would be. Right. And here's a fun, it, actually, that reminds me, there's a, a cool thing. Are you a fan of Wicked? You know, the, the musical Wicked? I don't. I don't know the movie. Oh, okay. um, but uh, my right. stepmother loved it, loved it. It's a, she so loved The is, Wizard of Oz. So this is a, a cool, uh, this is a cool Easter egg for your mother-in-law. Uh, uh, there's a song in Wicked, Unlimited, together we're unlimited. And the first three or four notes is the same as Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Oh. Uh, unlimited, somewhere over the rainbow. So he took the first, oh, I literally see. literally the minimum, the, he took the maximum number of notes he could use without getting sued. Have you seen Deadpool 2? Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> the acclaimed sequel to Deadpool. Uh, Deadpool 2 has a weird scene in it where he's watching, I think, Yentl, and he's talking about how it's the same song that's in the first Frozen. Have you remember that? Uh, funnily, I I don't remember that. I uh, and where my what's weird? Like when I growing up, everyone else listened. I feel like I feel like everyone else listened to rock and roll music. I was listening to soundtracks. Okay. So that's all I listened to growing up. And Did, yes, were your parents jo- into Star uh, soundtracks or? My dad. Your dad was uh, so, and is he a musician? Uh, he is a lawyer. He is a lawyer. Are, were you a yes. musician? Uh, n- uh, not really. I were took a year the... of the cello. Yeah, that's not even as as much as I was hoping for. <laughs> cello is lovely, though. It's I, it's my yes. what am I? It's it's the uh, French horn of the stringed instruments. What? Yeah, I know. 
Uh, but I, I was in choir, though. I did all uh, choir. Oh, and, that's uh, why. Yes. Because you were yeah. a theater I'm, nerd. Correct. There yes. you go. And I You're, did all the musicals. Yeah. That is outstanding. So you did all the musicals, and so you were in choir. Yeah. The, your musical, That's that counts. Yeah. Just because you, you you couldn't face the fact that it was a bass clef cello and it was too much. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I support you entirely. Um, I didn't like carrying an instrument that was as large as I am. <laughs> My brother uh, d- took the flute because it was the smallest instrument. And in oh, high yeah. school, he switched to the tuba because there were you got two tubas, one for home and one for the, and you only had to bring the mouthpiece. Anyway. And they did that with the bass, but they didn't do that with the cello players. We had to schlep the damn thing from home to school. Yes. And I might still be playing the cello today if I had a home cello You could have been Yo-Yo cello. Ma. You don't know. You don't know. And uh, But so what What did you sing in choir? What, what was the... <laughs> Okay, well, here, um, what usually, are you, are you well, an it started alto? with, <laughs> no, I, uh, I was a tenor one. Okay. Uh, so not the, not the counter tenor, not the, oh, you're a girl, oh, you're a guy. Uh, but the, the, um, the tenor one, which was basically, like elementary school choir was, you know, 15 Christmas songs and then the Hanukkah song. <laughs> Right. There is a Which, giant ripoff when you are in a Judeo-Christian society and they emphasize the Christian. It's a drag. But, you know, but in all fairness, the Hanukkah songs suck. I'm sorry, compared to the Christian songs. Yeah, there was a, uh, I think it was the Bare Naked Ladies had my favorite Hanukkah song. So it That's, was, yeah, that might be it. And you, Like this was one of the songs that we sang in elementary school. Make a little music, make a little music, make a little music for Hanukkah. Make a little music, make a little music, make a little music for Hanukkah. One clap. That's it. Wow, the That's joy. The joy is overwhelming. Yes. Um, yeah. Actually, now that I think about it, that is a pretty that that is a pretty Jewish song. Make a little music, not a lot. <laughs> don't overwhelm. Don't push yourself <laughs> too forward. You could be we'll murdered. Do a little bit. Just a little bit. It's the fe- Just you it's know, it's the festival of lights, but <laughs> only eight. <laughs> Nine if you count the middle one. Right? No. Is anyone lighting the middle one? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the one you you light that to light the other one. Oh, that's it. That's that's your starter candle. Right. Exactly. Fair enough. That's the, um, that's the Yule Brenner Yule Brenner candle that's recruiting the other candles to go save the. The village Aww. and the Magnificent Seven. That's so beautiful, the Magnificent Seven reference. Um, <laughs> the was uh, uh, Steve McQueen in the Magnificent Seven? Yes, because yes, he was. My father this very day was talking about the Magnificent Seven, and I didn't know if he was right, but he said Magnif- He kept uh, using his hat every time Yul Brenner would uh, talk, and so when they oh, wanted by the way, yeah. By the way, Magnificent Seven. Nice. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to be able to put this on YouTube. <laughs> we'll give it a shot. Um, but the uh, what they'll what they'll do on YouTube is they'll remove all of the the copyrighted content. So this will be 11 minutes, Rangers. Feel free to go to iTunes, DorkForest.com, to listen to the actual podcast. Yeah. So it's what, actually yeah. And just in case, by the way, I want to throw this out there too because i also mentioned i could talk about the starship ships and i know you'd already done a podcast and i listened to that podcast and uh i feel like he gave like a really good uh like a 101 course in starships but i could be the professor that's like the 301 course and he's like oh he has he has no family this is this is him so i can (laughs) and then robert hurt could come back and do the 501 and then you could come (laughs) back and do the 900 level okay yeah tell me about your favorite spaceships let's hear it Um, yeah, well, that well, because he was talking about, uh, and I actually I was thinking I could do I could go movie by movie and do the music and the spaceship, and we just kind of cover. <laughs> Please we just, do. We cover everything. Oh my God, do movie <laughs> by movie with the, yes. Uh, but the the guy I wanted to talk about though, because you mentioned John Williams, yeah. and everyone knows John Williams, and John Williams is probably going to be, I, I think of is good. Five hundred years from now, they're going to still be playing John Williams. That's my prediction. Okay. He's like our he's our Mozart. Okay. Uh, dare I say it? Dare I say it? <laughs> you dared, uh, and I don't. Sure, I believe you. Uh, the guy I want to talk about is Jerry Goldsmith. Okay. Uh, first of all, have you ever heard of Jerry Goldsmith? I have not. Ah, 
uh, so Jerry Goldsmith, uh, I think, has did way more movies than John Williams. Jerry, Go- well, uh, Jerry, Star Trek: The Motion Picture, Star Trek: The Next Generation theme song. That's Jerry Goldsmith. Okay. Uh, da 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 da. And uh, so if we if we start with uh, uh, Star Trek: The Motion Picture, Goldsmith, yeah. by the way, was supposed to have scored the original series. Okay. Uh, due to scheduling conflicts, didn't so they got Alexander Courage. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, uh, yes. So. Uh, what else did so that guy do? Alexander Courage. He did. Uh, I don't think he did anything. Uh, he, he he did a, out of th- other things. Right. But nothing that comes to mind. Like Goldsmith. I mean, that's I that's, that's not enough residuals to really, to really live off of. So. Yeah, but right. Jerry and Goldsmith. The original series was. Oh, no, you, sorry, you go ahead. I feel like I keep interrupting you. You're the host of the podcast. Uh, I have to stop what? that. I'm not supposed to interrupt you. You're the guest. <laughs> I'm supposed to allow you to dork out. And it's a it's a common problem. 13 years in, you'd think I'd have it down. Uh, but yeah, so t- tell me about uh, Goldsmith. Where'd he come from? Goldsmith. Who is he? How yes. tall is he? What's Goldsmith. his jam? Goldsmith came out of the, you know, he and John Williams were classically trained and were trained by these uh, like highly, highly revered, classically trained pianists and they came from more of the classical music zone uh, and, and were also influenced by like Alfred Newman and the, uh, you know, the, the golden era Hollywood composers. Alfred uh, E. Goldsmith, Newman? I think, no, it's probably Alfred Newman. Okay. Because Alfred E. Newman is mad. I think he's <laughs> mad, right? I don't know. Yes. Alfred Newman though, I think, uh, uh, Alfred Newman was a composer. Uh, Famously, uh, and his, in fact, his sons, or his, either sons or grandsons, like Randy Newman, uh, oh. um, Thomas Newman, it's all the same family of composers. Okay. It's the Newmans. The Newmans. The Newmans. That's it. Newman. <laughs> uh, not, I don't know. That would have been a fun episode of Seinfeld if he found out he was distantly related to those Newmans, but I don't think they ever did that. Oh, uh, that's a anyway. one shot that needs to be made. Go. <laughs> Uh, so Goldsmith comes out of that uh, uh, and started working for TV, and his he was really good because he was fast. He could pound out a new composition like Gangbusters, and that was back when they were doing like the live TV back in the fifties. Oh right. So that's like Playhouse ninety. I think he did a lot of that, uh, uh, where they're you know it's it's all like it's we're going to do a play live. Uh, uh, no, no editing, nothing. It's it'll happen, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Right. Uh, go. Uh, and then eventually worked his way into movies and did had, has had a prolific career that in the '60s, '70s, '80s. Uh, he did uh, what are some notable early ones? Uh, Planet of the Apes. What? Goldsmith did Planet Goldsmith. of the Apes. Yes. Wow. And was notable because it was so atonal and crazy and. Uh, very tribal sounding, you know, and, and moving away from a traditional Hollywood score to try to. Uh, the other thing that, Gold, that like I love about Goldsmith talk. is that. Go- there we. Is that a. I, I don't know that one. Is pillow that, Talk, it's, it's uh, Rock Hudson, Doris Day. Anyway, uh, ah, it, the music uh, was all right. Yeah, I. Like, uh, to quote uh, the, your last podcast, Hurt, was his name Hurt? Robert? R- Robert Hurt, yeah. The, the spaceships. Yeah, Robert. To quote, to quote Robert Hurt, uh, uh, if there is a spaceship in the movie, I will see it. Okay. If there's not a spaceship. <laughs> got nothing. Like if Knights and Rodanth had a spaceship, if it was on a spaceship, I would have seen it. Did you see 2001? Uh, multiple times. That's how much of a nerd I am. How, what's multiple, the song I to can, that one? That's got a famous song, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Ba, 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 oh, right. bum, ba. And then also, ba, da, 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 oh. bum, 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 bum. Did he write ba, that? Da, Whoever wrote da. that? So all of that, what happened with 2001, all of that is classical music. That's what so I thought. The, <laughs> yeah. And, and Kubrick used the classical music as a temp track, basically. And then hired, uh, I think, Alex North to do the score. Okay. Alex North turns in the score. Cooper goes, I like the classical music. And done. Yes. And I, and I, I think that might have been a situation where Alex North might have been sitting in the, in the opening. And then the movie plays. And he's like, where's, where's my music? Right. 
Oh my god. It happens and this happened this happened to Goldsmith too. They will they will do an entire score for a movie and then throw out the score. What? And then just yes. use something else or anything else? They, with Goldsmith, uh, do you remember the movie Legend, the Tom Cruise? Uh, Unfortunately, I do. I saw that one in the theater. <laughs> yes. So probably the version you saw had, uh, I think it was Tangerine Dream did the score. And it was like kind of this rock and roll kind of... Yeah, yeah. thing. Well, Jerry Goldsmith did the entire score for that movie. And then I think the studio decided it wasn't hip enough, so they threw it out. Wow. And I think there was one guy, like the sound designer, thought, this is a good score. I might just, just in case, I'm going to keep the tapes for this. And if he hadn't have, the score would have been lost. And so then, years later, they re-released the movie with his score. Oh, really? And, yes. And is, uh, they released his CD, uh, which is a great Jerry Goldsmith score, if you're a Jerry Goldsmith fan. Right, which, right. What, what have yeah. they done... With, are there other cool stories like that? Like, oh, man. like weird, uh, like people getting well, the job, t- people losing the job, people. Oh yeah, yeah. So Judge Dredd, uh, the uh, 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 Sylvester Stallone oh, version. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they hire Goldsmith. Uh, he he composes about thirty seconds of something. And I'm that's too high. Anyway, he he records thirty seconds of it. The movie gets delayed. Goldsmith can't do the score, so they bring in Alan Silvestri to do the score. But there's this thirty seconds, right? And they ended up using the thirty seconds in the trailer for Judge Dredd and in other movie trailers. Okay, so. It's probably, like, if you hear the music, you're like, I've heard that before. Yeah. Uh, so there's, that happened. Goldsmith was hired to do Timeline, but it was, uh, they had to recut, they had to severely recut the movie, and this was kind of a sad story. This was close to when Goldsmith was dying, so he couldn't come back, so they had to get somebody else to do the second take on the score. Right. But they, um, yeah, there's a... Uh, uh, yeah, that I, I, that happens uh, a lot. Where they uh, another example actually was the you know the whole uh, there's been a whole you know issue with uh, I'm sure you've noticed with the DC movies uh, not quite working the way they wanted to with the Marvel movies. So they had right. Batman versus Superman. Or, I'm sorry, Batman v Sur- Superman, right. not versus v Superman. Right. Uh, the new version of Zimmer. versus. Yes. And I want to Hans Zimmer. By the way, here's my here's my here's my hot take on Hans Zimmer. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Hans Zimmer? Uh, Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer. Now, he's Hans Zimmer. I think was responsible for shifting the paradigm away from kind of John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith, you know, Star Wars, E.T., Jurassic Park, away from like a classical sensibility, more to a you know, I don't want to not necessarily rock, but a modern. A modern sensibility. Okay, more so, guitars, less violins. I think what happens is that whenever there's a movie that's a huge blockbuster, everyone goes, all right, copy whatever that is. Even down so, to the music? A lot, yeah. Because, like, here, like this is, this is my fa- I, I can't prove this, but I have a theory. So, you've got, you've got Spielberg and Lucas uh, pounding out these seminal movies, you know, Star Wars, uh, E.T., Jaws, Indiana Jones, which changes the nature of blockbusters. In, in fact, I think they're the ones who are kind of credited with creating the blockbusters. Right. So what that what happened, and John Williams scores all of them. But he keeps calling me, and I keep having to turn You out. should also tell the booth that uh, I'm hearing an echo of my own voice, which will shut me up, which is nice. Uh, but uh, uh, they ooh, might the want to turn down their voice. volume. <laughs> Okay, Bo- yeah, Booth, if you can turn down the uh, volume. I- it doesn't matter if, yeah, you can. Ray, does that make sense? Not the volume, uh, the... Uh, can he hear, the... can you hear me twice? He seems to have Again, done it. Can you help him? Good. He seems to have Amber, done it. Amber's going to go in to help him. All right, anyway. So, uh, uh, and I'm also going to, sorry. I'm You're talking about, I think, off. DC movies and the blockbuster, and that's where you were. Right. So, uh, yes. So they, 
you know, they come around and you've got basically the Lucasfilm era, uh, Star Wars uh, and Indiana Jones and um, et cetera. And John Williams is scoring all of these movies. Right. You want to turn your phone off? Or calling me. I've been there. Yeah. I've been there. Here's the good news is uh, I'm out in the garage and there's no phone out here. <laughs> so uh, usually my, my home phone goes off during the dork forest. There I'll you go. It good out. call. You'll be able to answer She's that call girl. in 35 minutes. Actually, that might not have been Barb. That might have been Flappers calling. Hilarious. Okay. So I, I, don't, I don't want to pin the blame on Barb because Barb is sensitive to knowing that we were recording this. Right. And you uh, should know that I'm talking to Josh uh, Schneider and he is at Flappers right now. And, and, uh, at, and they have uh, virtual shows seven nights a week. And uh, his handle is at Nerdy Virgin. Anyway, so keep going. Okay. So, all right. So, you, like I said, you've got John Williams uh, is doing all these scores. So, inevitably, all the studios want clones of these big budget movies. So, for Star Wars, there's all these movies that started to Like, that was why the, the Star Trek movie, the Star Trek, the motion picture, that's what got the green light with Star Wars. Oh, okay. The Paramount's going, what do we have? We got to do something. Yeah. Oh, we got this Star Trek. Go. So then, inevitably, Jerry Goldsmith ends up having to score all of the clones or a lot of the clones of the uh -huh. John Williams movies. So, and I think he even mentions this in, what, in the Star Trek commentary. What he's probably hearing for the next 10 years is, can it sound like Star Wars? Can it sound like Indiana <laughs> Jones? Can it sound like can it Did sound he like go Superman? to college with John Williams by any chance? Uh, did they no, know each other? I think, I think they did. I, I actually think that he hired John Williams way, way back... I think he got John Williams one of his first jobs, I think. Um, and I know that they, I, and I always wondered if they had any kind of a relationship or if they talked about scores or if they're like, guess what I have to score now? <laughs> I, have to, I have to score space combat now. Great. It's, uh, <laughs> right. You, uh, you got me a lot of work. In other news, they want it to look <laughs> just like yours. Right. <laughs> and so, like, and you can, and what's cool is you can, like, I can, uh, side by like, uh, you know, for uh, like for instance, Indiana Jones. And then this movie called King Solomon's Mines comes along, mm -hmm. which actually was made way in the 30s, I think. But the remake of it uh, was greenlit because of Indiana Jones. So Jerry Goldsmith then does. Okay. Then you got Superman, John Williams. And then Jerry Goldsmith does Supergirl, the 1984 movie that did not quite do well, which no. is... So I almost, it's almost like a dialogue between the two right. of them, or like a dueling banjo. <laughs> Right, right. It's the it's a duet where neither they're not in the same room. It's ebony and ivory, you guys. Uh, yes, very beautiful. And and, and then even uh, uh, yeah. So that's uh, so I, I I can't help but feel there must have been frustration on Jerry Goldsmith's part of that. Um, yeah, we're doing uh, uh, we're, we're doing Supergirl. Yeah, it's a sequel to Superman. Yeah, we're gonna need. Uh, Superman, but not Superman. <laughs> We're not right, going to invest in it like we did with Superman. We're, so Goldsmith ended up being sort of the lower, the, the poor man's version because he, he got paid less, probably? No, I, well, but the weird thing is that he, like, he's considered, like he's A-list. And he, there are a lot of other movies he's doing And it's union. I bet you it's a union gig. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. So, and, and these are all, the, the, the weird thing is, is that these are all, all of these movies that he's doing are big budget movies, but they're all still trying to cash in on Star Wars or Indiana Jones. Right. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, you know I, I think it was, so Fox has Star Wars, so Paramount's like, okay, we got, what's our version? Star Trek, go. Yes. Throw a ton of money into it, let's do it. So it's, you know, they're, they're high quality clones. Yes. But clones nonetheless. Star and then... <laughs> Although Star, Star Trek, the motion picture, and I was thinking about this, it's a weird name for that. I don't, Star Trek, the motion picture, because motion pictures have been around for, you know, what, 70, 80 years by then, so we already know. 
yeah, we know it's going to be a movie. It's going to be a talkie. Right. Yeah. I, like, it's almost as if were they afraid someone was going to go, oh, they're Star Trek. Well, I'll just, when, when it comes out, it must be on my television. I'm not <laughs> going to go to a movie theater because that would be absurd. I only know it as a TV show. Yeah. Yeah, there was, that, that's the least of that movie's problems. But it does start there. Uh. I, I love Star Trek. The, Star Trek the motion picture, you have to realize <laughs> that the first half of Star Trek the motion picture is the story of a ship that can't start. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. We can't, we can't get out of space talk. And, and uh, there should be a drinking game. How many times does Kirk say that object is two days away from Earth? In every scene, you go back and watch. There's an object that is a day and a half away from Earth. <laughs> Tick, that is response talk, to everything. Goes that object. Uh, wow. I have not seen Star Trek The Motion Picture, I think, since I've seen parts of it on cable in mm. the 90s or maybe the early 2000s. I'm okay with that. I know you're a TNG fan. Here's some TNG soundtrack trivia for okay. you. Okay. Uh, so they, they didn't, there was a point at which they wanted to get Jerry Goldsmith's score for the uh, opening titles for Next Generation, but they didn't know if they could get the rights to do it. So Dennis McCarthy, who uh, scored a lot of the TNG episodes, he also scored Deep Space Nine. Ba da 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 you can actually hear, uh, if you buy the Next Generation uh, soundtrack, they have it. And in some of the first and second season episodes, you can hear, when he's scoring the episode, he uses that theme under some of the action. And it's... Which usually he'll play like right at the end of the episode where they... Picard's like, well, that planet's screwed, but we're fine. Let's... <laughs> Let's go. Oh. I, there is a, um, I digress briefly to tell you that there was a comedian who, uh, and I feel like they were not alone, but it was back, I think, in the early 90s, late 80s, uh, who did a joke about how the soundtrack to the Brady Bunch, which, do you remember how that goes? The Brady Bunch, but there's a story. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da
Uh, and so they, then in the Wonder Woman movie, Hans Zimmer didn't score that movie. It was, I think, uh, Hart, who was it? Uh, Gregson Williams, I think, or maybe Henry Jackman. I can't remember who did the Wonder Woman movie. And they used that theme in it at points. But they, he had another theme that he used that I can't, that I never honestly bothered to learn. Uh, and then, <laughs> uh, now for this Wonder Woman 1984 that's coming out, Hans Zimmer is scoring that one. So I would imagine that he's going to use his theme that he came up with that actually first appeared in Batman v Superman. Okay. Oh, so he's doing that. And do you know who scored, like, the Marvel movies, like Captain Marvel? Uh, Captain Marvel, you know, I was just listening to Captain Marvel yesterday to try to learn it in time because I know you're a big Captain Marvel fan. Bit of a Captain Marvel fan. Didn't quite get there, and that was someone I'd never heard of before, but a female composer. That's neat. I think they're, I think they're trying to kind of mix uh, it, mix it up. Yes, because it's it, it has been a boys' club in terms of the the scoring. So you just the, described the Earth in the last sixty thousand <laughs> years, but uh, that, but I that like true. that they're trying. That's good. I enjoy yes. any sort of effort to be inclusion inclusionary. Of uh, are there. Speaking of which, are there black composers? Are there famous black composers that you know about? Or brown composers? Or Asian? Or... Um, I, uh, I think... Uh, How about Miyazaki? I think the guy who did... Who? Guy, well, Miyazaki, well... Well, who composes his stuff, right? Uh, I think his name is Joe Hitachi, who's uh, Japanese. And I can... What can I sing of... Uh, uh, here's... Uh, um, what's the name of the movie? Uh, da, 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 da. Come on, Josh. I know, the, I know the song, but I don't know the movie. Uh... Uh, what was the one where Patrick Stewart was one of the voices, and it's... Oh, it um, wasn't Ponyo. No, it, this was... Do you know that Ponyo loves one, ham? One of the early, um, I do, actually. I'm a huge Miyazaki fan. Yeah. I know, I, I can go with you. If you go through the door of Miyazaki, I will follow uh, <laughs> uh, with bells and whistles on. Is there... Uh, do you, uh, do you uh, know Nausicaa. The, Nausicaa. Oh, Nausicaa. I was I know just going to say, do you love not Because that's my favorite one. Yes. Do you know the music uh, from da 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 knows what the song is, and then I can sing the song and they hear it. Okay. Then, then it works. That's how, that yeah, moment that is, right there. It's recognition laughs. Uh, yes. I recommend more punchlines. Uh, I recognition, <laughs> milk the recognition laugh for all that it's worth, but then yes. uh, write a joke about that. That Because uh, th- uh, there have been many comics who have just done bits where it's just like, remember this? Gilligan's Island? Yes. Oh, my God. How could they knock it off that island? Anyway. That describes the first eight and a half years of my stand-up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's almost everybody's first initial whatever until they realize, oh, I see what I'm doing. Anyway. Hey, so- this, remember this? This is the thing. <laughs> I got to laugh. Thank God. Look over there. I just Josh. needed a reaction. But uh, let's see. Should I think of other? So who, the, what are the spaceships you like from Star Trek, the next, the motion picture? The Star Trek, the motion picture, which, so, uh, capitalize, or piggybacking off of what Hurt said, um, that, uh, that was his favorite enterprise. Um, a few uh, uh, little uh, tidbits about that. In order to create the effect and to make the ship look bigger, they actually used a bunch of dental mirrors and sh- uh, beamed a light on the dental mi- mirrors and had it reflect on the surface of the model because it would create little flecks of light. So it made it look like this is a massive ship that's made of millions and millions of different interlocking pieces. Okay. Wow. Uh, also, uh, yes, Robert Probert, uh, who designed it, um, was influenced by the Cadillac. So if you look at the fins on the back of the nacelles of the motion picture Enterprise, there's these little fins coming off the back. That he got that from the back of a Cadillac. Well, there you go. A lot of the guys who are designing the ships, they, they are influenced by cars. Like Defiant was another ship that you discussed in that podcast. Yes, long-time listener. Um, and the Defiant was, again, they took inspiration from the grills of sports cars. So okay. if you think of the front of the Defiant, it, it's reminiscent and the, the, the of... The Defiant was the, was the sort of fist of a, of, a, of a spaceship from Deep Space Nine, right? 
It was Correct. like a little. It, it was. was like a. It was so. It was sort of. It looked dense. It looked like a black hole of a ship, where I was like, Wait. "We're going." And yes. <laughs> It was, uh, it was described, Iris Stephen Bear was, became the head writer of Deep Space Nine, and he said, we need a ship that's on a, on a five-year mission to kick ass. Oh, there you go. And, <laughs> it's, a li- and yeah, it was, it's like a muscle car of a, of a ship. Is it? Um, yes. Yeah, I think that was one of his favorite ships. It's, uh, and then, oh, by the way, do you, know the, do you know the Deep Space Nine Babylon 5 kind of drama? Uh, I just did an episode with Robert Hurt about Babylon 5, and you'd think I would uh-huh. know that, but I don't. What is it? Okay, so, all right, so here's the skinny. So, J. Michael Straczynski, brilliant man, by the way, uh, 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 comes up with, with Babylon 5, pitches it to Paramount. Oh. Paramount passes. That's right. Moments then, later. Yes. Yes. Now, as he put it, he, what he thinks, because he doesn't think any of the Deep Space Nine writers... New, yeah. but he thinks that the executives influenced them having heard his pitch. Right. That, that I, Robert did mention that in the, in the episode. That is, yeah. that is unfortunate. The thing is, the zeitgeist, the, the Petri dish that is Los Angeles, is that when, you, when one idea come, get, comes up, all of a sudden, if you watch any sort of sitcoms or TV shows, and all of a sudden you'll see a premise that you had or even a mm. bit where you're like, hmm, I don't think that was stolen so much as influenced. Like it was just sort parallel of inspired thinking. by. Or, yeah, mm. parallel thinking for sure because then it's out in the ether, right? Like COVID droplets. Oh, by, the way, by the way, Babylon 5 soundtrack. Da, 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 Do you own the albums? Or do you have them, um, I, like, do you have them on Spotify, or do you have them? Mostly, uh, mostly on iTunes. I mean, a lot of these, I, I have some of the original CDs that I've dragged around with me, but now... I either will have it on iTunes or people have thrown it up on their YouTubes and I listen to it there. Nice. And is and, that sort uh, of like yeah. your relaxation music? Like you'll throw on a soundtrack? And do you like to yep. listen to it start to finish? Or do you like to just sort of pick tracks like you do on any album? I, what I've been doing, I've been creating playlists okay. now because I, I like, uh, uh, and sometimes I find I'll get... Will you create me it. a spaceship playlist of eight songs and put it on Spotify that we can send out to the world? Is that such a thing? Is that possible? Uh, yes, that is. Do you now? Do you want you want it to be a bit more like actiony space or more like laid back uh, legato space? I think action. I want eight okay, good. power ballads. I want eight spaceship power ballads. <laughs> yeah, I can get that done. Okay. That's get that awesome. Because we've got, I mean, Star Trek, you got Star Trek, the motion picture. Then you got Star Trek 2, which is James Horner. Okay. Who sadly died in a plane crash. Ooh. Tragically. Uh, uh, which was, and, but Star Trek 2 is ba da 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 which they also used for Star Trek 3. Okay. Um, by the way, a quick thought. I feel like every Star Trek movie is, let's try to be as good as Wrath of Khan. Oh, uh, we didn't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wait, was that number three? I feel like that was three. Wrath of Khan was two. Oh, was, so is it, how does it go? Is it the even ones are good or the odd ones are good? It has to be the evens if Wrath yeah, of Khan. The even one, well, yes, the even ones are good. But here's why. Because uh, of Nicholas Meyer. That's my theory. Okay. Nicholas Meyer, so he, he wrote the novel Time After Time. And the seven percent solution, and also I might have directed them too. Uh, so he's a great writer. And uh, time after time was H.G. Wells is chasing Jack the Ripper in the future, or in like, or in the modern day. Uh, which was, and they made the movie was uh, who was it? It was uh, McDowell. Um, Andy Malcolm McDowell. McDowell and, uh, not Andy McDowell. No, that would have been that would have been the romantic comedy version. Where she's like, I just don't know who to choose. <laughs> I'm in love with both of them. H.G. Wells yeah. and Jack the Ripper. <laughs> <laughs> totally different movie. I want to see that uh, movie too. Uh, and Barry Steenburgen, who falls in love with Malcolm McDowell, uh, the time-traveling guy, and then she proceeds to fall in love with Christopher Lloyd in Back to the Future 3. So that she Aww. became that person. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> it was, uh, she, liked a, she likes a nerdy scientist guy. 
She does. She, yes, she that she became that person. And but uh, so Nicholas Meyer directed Star Trek II and kind of also wrote it. I don't think he got credit for it, but he sort of he sort of that was one of those situations where he sort of did write it. Um, he wrote Star Trek II. He wrote all of the scenes in Star Trek IV. That was the the whale one. Okay. So he wrote all of the scenes where they're back in the in the modern day. And Spock Dur- on the bus with the guy with the boombox. Yep. You gotta love that. Yep. In fact, a lot of the gags that he came up with in that were gags that he couldn't use in Time After Time, which was the Jack the Ripper one. Okay. And then, and then he directed Star Trek VI. So he, was, he had a hand in two, four, and six. Okay. And if you notice, then, they, then we switched to the next generation, and you had Generations, which was okay. It was Kirk okay. and Spock together. Um, and that's that situation. And Whoopi Kirk Goldberg. Spock, she was great. No. There were some... Sorry, Kirk and, Kirk and Picard together. Kirk I'm so Picard. sorry. Yeah, I apologize yeah. Kirk to Kirk and Picard listeners. together with Whoopi Goldberg. Yes. And it was all right. It, well, it was, that, it was that thing where they're like, like, come back with me to the moment in the past where we can save the future. But it's like, you know, if you came back a week earlier, you'd give yourself a lot some easier. Time. Do you remember that yes. TV show, Seven Days? Yeah, with, wasn't it with, uh, was it LaPaglia or who was in it? It was some, uh, some was sort of, one of the nepotism. Baldwins? It was, uh, yeah. I forget who the lead was, but he was the son of somebody famous. And right. he could go back in time just seven days. Right. So yeah. if, and he had seven days to prevent something that had happened that morning. Right. And I, I knew of it. I never watched it, though. I ended up watching knew, like knew- five or six. There was a time in the 90s when I would watch uh, a, a test pattern. If the colors would change often enough, it was a simple, it was a simpler time. It was a time when... Well, Actually, another reference to the last podcast, you mentioned Space Above and Beyond. Space Marines? Yep. It was called Space Above and Beyond. That's right. It was, yeah, on for a, a season. Just, uh, it was created by the same, it was created by two of the guys from X-Files. That's how they got to create it. Right. Uh, Morgan and Wong. It had so much names. potential. It had... I thought it had a really good, um, an, a really because it had an aliens kind of vibe to it. Not alien, but aliens. Because uh, yes, bum, 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 bum. That was the alien score, which alien became one of the most used aliens too. Two aliens, the second one. Yes. What? Uh, were uh, the, uh, one of the most what? That the score from Aliens, specifically that mo- that that uh, that that rising climax one. Bum, 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 bum. That was used in like a m- bunch of trailers. It was like the number one most used trailer music for years. Oh, okay. And was um, it, um, w- was there a good ship in the movie Alien or Aliens? <sighs> there was well, just sort it, of that sort of mech thing. Yeah, because uh, Ridley Scott, who made the first Alien, he... He saw Star Wars came out and he go, I want I want to make that even dirtier. I want if Star Wars is grunge in space, I want these guys to be these dirty truck drivers. Right. So the Nostromo, <laughs> which was the ship in Alien, was yeah, meant to be this this grungy oil refinery in space kind of thing. Right. And then the ship in Aliens, uh, this is James Cameron going, I want the ship to look like a giant gun. And that's what they did. Interesting. That's great. How about the expanse? All right. Here's my take on the expanse. Great. I, I haven't really. I didn't get into it, and and I I'm ashamed to admit this because the ships were not sexy enough. I kind of I lost. I I couldn't keep going. Well, you know, Robert they, they Hurd is too, an astrophysicist. Yeah. And so I know. what he liked about it was he liked that the science worked. Or yes, the science I, I, was the science was speculative enough that it that it was based on actual science. But so right. the, but, no, I, but the spaceships themselves were not cool looking enough for you? Not but, cool not cool enough. Like even Babylon enough? 5 which also and Hurt talked about this, the, uh, Babylon 5 was also they tried to be scientifically accurate. Mm-hmm. Well, the cool thing about Babylon 5 is that one of the ships in Babylon 5 uh, the, the 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 basically their version of the aircraft carrier, one of them was called the Agamemnon. Right. Um, now Another another big tangent, but did they talk about what happened to the actor who played the captain on Babylon Five when you did the Babylon Five I thing? I believe he did, but w- remind me because I my mind is a sieve. Well, back well, 
uh, uh, Michael O'Hare played Jefferson Clare on the first season of Babylon 5. That's right. After the end of the first season, he departs, and officially it was, well, it's, he, he didn't, it wasn't really working for him, he's, uh, and, and it wasn't working for us, and it was mutually, ex, mutually agreed upon, this isn't working out. It's something like that. Very underplayed. And then Bruce Boxleitner comes in and does the other four seasons. So, uh, Straczynski recently comes out with the fact that Michael O'Hare was actually suffering from schizophrenia and thought that the government was after him and was l- having a psychotic break. Ah. And, and, so they, and they didn't want to announce that because they didn't want to kill his career. Right, that felt so, rude. It felt rude. To, wh- yes. Why don't you just get that guy some help, let him reboot... And then, and then, because they didn't, they bring him back at near the end of the season, the end of the run. I think he, I think it was to the point. Yeah, they 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 brought him back to do two episodes so they could, so they could finish his arc. But I think he was so. I don't think they could. I don't think he was in enough in a good enough shape to do a series regular. Okay. Like they re- really like they had to. You know, he had to be on meds, and it was. It affected like he couldn't his tell, work. Yeah. He couldn't tell reality versus fantasy. I mean, it was really bad. That's unfortunate. That's sad. And it was very, well, it was sad because he was on, he was starting to get better. And then I think he went off the meds and, and disappeared and right. ended up, and he's, he died. Psych but, meds. The only meds that people are like, I'm feeling better. I think I'm going to stop taking the or recommended doctor dosage. And I'm like, you know, I have a degree in political science. Let me tell you when you should stop taking your, your meds. Uh, it's <laughs> never. Uh, talk to a doctor. Uh, talk to a doctor. Yeah, so there's that that horrible story. Okay, we I feel like uh, this has become the podcast of tangents. Harry uh, Goldsmith. That is a regular. <laughs> you you've you've jumped right into the deep end of the dark forest where we're like, I'm a diamond. I got a lot of facets. I got a lot of dorkdoms. <laughs> and uh, that is you exactly, quite honestly. And we only have about ten minutes left. So, um, what have you been wanting? <laughs> what have you been wanting to tell me? I don't, well, I, all of all of it. This is the only. This is the only time I can have this kind of conversation. Like, I, I, I ended. Up, I was going balls deep into a Doctor Who conversation with someone, and I realized about 15 minutes in. Oh, oh, they want to go home. <laughs> I was like, oh no, I'm that person. Oh, doggone it. Doggone it. But uh, uh, that person is welcome here in the Dork Forest. We're looking for that guy, uh, that girl, that right. lady, uh, that they, them. Scores. All right. Bring I, it. Uh, what, what, are the, what are the things you need to know about scores? Okay, so we were talking about, all right, the, the, the actions. What are the actions spaceship? So you got Star Trek 1, Star Trek 2. Star Trek 3 was uh, Horner again. Star Trek 4, they bring in Leonard Rosenman because he had done more contemporary, he had done movies that took place in the present day and they wanted a more present day sound. They brought him in. Uh, five. Uh, okay, I, I, I have a very strong opinion about Star Trek Five. This was the Search for God one. That. What is um, that one? I forgot which one that one was. So it, Star Trek Five is universally considered by Trekkies as the worst one of the movies. Okay. Except me. Right. <laughs> I mean, I love Star Trek Five. Okay. And I'm one. You may never find. If you find another person on on any of the Dork Forests that you've done that loves Star Trek Five. I, I would be shocked. Joseph Scrimshaw came on and literally talked about how much he loved the Star Wars prequels. This is an attainable goal. Someone, someone does <laughs> love Star Trek Five, and it's you. What uh, was the What was the premise? That one was. Uh, remember, they uh, uh, this is Spock's half brother hijacks the ship and uh, to, tries to take it to go find God, and they find this giant floating head of energy that's not God. Just an asshole, basically. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I need to see this movie again. Uh, yes. And, the, and the, there's, a, the, there's an early scene, there's a campfire scene where they're trying to teach Spock how to do, ro- sing Row, Row, Row Your Boat, and he keeps going. <laughs> I don't, I'm trying to understand what the mu- song means. The, what, life is not a dream. And they're like, no, just sing the damn song. Right, we're which trying I to do rounds. Real- okay. Yes, <laughs> which I thought was, which was a funny scene, but I think a, they were, because... It was a situation they're they're trying to make it as funny as Star Trek Four, but it didn't quite work as well. I, I don't know. I don't care. I like the movie. Um, what I, did you did, enjoy about that movie? Did you like that the, that God turned out to just be an asshole pretending to be God? I well, I mean, I, I that's uh, a theme. Yes. Of, that's a Star Trek theme. Remember that yeah. planet that they find with all the Greek gods on it? 
Uh, yeah. And they're I'm, just I'm jackasses? Shit. Vaguely. I, I've seen all of TNG multiple times. The original series, I've not, I've not seen all of the original series. I, I, I'm that guy. I hate to be that guy. But. Well, I hate to be uh, the person who hasn't seen them all, hunt, all, all of everything, because I claim to be a Star Trek fan, but I, you, could, you could stump me in a heartbeat. So it's okay. and, and, but then I let it go. Then I said to myself, are you going to let part of your self-esteem be built on that hill? Don't do it. <laughs> and uh, so. So, we got, so Star Trek VI, uh, scored by Cliff Eidelman, I think is how you say his name, Heavily influenced by the planets and Holst. Um, uh, Holst is uh, uh, the, the classical music. I think he's a Russian. Uh, uh, da, 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 dun, 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 ba, 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 oh, ba, yeah. ba, which I know uh, is people have used it all, in, all over the place and. Uh, that's that's Holst. Now Star Trek Six is with the Klingon quoting Shakespeare. <laughs> Six is a great one. Uh, and then yeah, Generations was Dennis McCarthy. Uh, First Contact, the best of the Next Generation movies. Mm-hmm. That's the Borg one. Yeah. Then they bring back Jerry Goldsmith and All Is Well. Okay, and All Is Well. <laughs> Because it's uh, the Borg, it's Jerry Goldsmith, and it's what's his name as the guy who has grade schools named after him. That, but he's a, just Jeffrey a, Cochran. That's it. That's it. Uh, you're right, uh, James Cromwell. James, James Cromwell. Cromwell also also played a couple different roles in uh, Next Generation. Yes. To go back. Yes, I remember Who's that. It? It's. Uh, I wonder if uh, he's related to William Cromwell at all. If he go back far enough. That's the one detail I don't know. Oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> uh, but First Contact, and here's what I love about Goldsmith's score in First Contact. So, Goldsmith, he made many themes for Star Trek The Motion Picture. One of them was the Klingons. Oh, yeah, they're about to fight. They're going down. They're, they're yeah. bringing it. And so, in Star Trek First Contact, especially in the beginning part, when the Enterprise is swooping in to fight the Borg Cube, when we see Worf for the first time, he brings back that theme every time you see Worf. Okay. So it's this he this is he is weaving all the kind of the classic hits together in that one music cue. Right. That, that'll be one of the cues that I add, actually. Okay. That'll be the one. That'll be great. Uh, yes. Uh, so first contact. Insurrection was they go to the planet Santa Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> And they save the aliens, and you can tell they're an alien race because they wear clothes that breathe. Uh, oh, wow. I don't know. Uh, Insurrection. Have I seen that? Yeah. Or that is one, that the it, one with Chris Pine? No. Uh, there's Insurrection and then Nemesis. These are two other, the last two Next Generation movies. Okay. Nemesis is, we're trying so hard to be Wrath of Khan. Not quite. Uh, um, wait, didn't they, they have, bring him back? Didn't they bring Khan back for that one? No, you're 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 uh, you're thinking I'm, of the J.J. Abrams ones. Oh, there Nemesis you go. Was Picard fighting his own clone? And so, what did they do <laughs> instead of having Picard play the clone, which would make sense when you've got a Shakespearean actor who would awesome? It would be awesome to see evil Picard. They don't do that. They get Tom Hardy, who's great, but doesn't really look like Patrick Stewart no. to play his clone. Ah, ah. then. Uh, then the fran- then Enterprise is on TV, and that kind of the franchise gets fatigued, stops. Now we get to the J.J. Abrams Star Trek, uh, and that the theme is ba da 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 da. And Abrams goes the, the way he described it. He always thought that Star Trek was classical and Star Wars was rock and roll. I want to put more rock and roll into Star Trek. What so, I always thought was that J.J. Uh, Abrams uh, decided to tell me that Spider-Man gets bit by a spider over and over and over again. How about you just write a, spa- a Star Trek story? That would be cool. It doesn't have to be like Star Wars, and it doesn't have to be like anything except itself. And I don't need to hear Kirk's asshole origin story because he was a dick. <laughs> That's... Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and a movie can be... Well, here, now the interesting thing about that that Star Trek that that I found is that there's a deleted scene from the first Abrams Star Trek, 
uh, where there was actually a period where the bad guy was captured by Klingons. And we got to see, not their faces, but we got to see the Klingons, one of the Klingons interrogating them. And the way that they were dressed is they were dressed in 1960s uh, Russian-looking trench coats. Okay. And the one, like the design of that movie, where they basically took the 1960s sensibility, but modernized it. I thought it would, would, if they had gone that way with the Klingons, if they made the Klingons, if they suggested like that Cold War Russian thing, I thought that was a really cool, that could have been really cool, but they... They didn't do it. Right. There's, there were too many. It felt like it was just muddy. It felt yes. like the, there just wasn't a clear enough vision for it because it looked cool and it had a lot of potential. I just, uh, um, it just wasn't for me in the end. It was less. And, and then he, he, they, you know, Kirk, they, they launch Kirk in a tube, on a little, in a little tube, and he crash lands on a planet and it just happens to be near where Spock is. It's just like, yeah. Can you, you know, I mean, it has to be. We don't want to spend, you know, three days trying to figure out where Spock is on this planet. But um, was that no. the one where they had the giant drill that was going to drill into the center of the? Yes. Yeah. And let's do it. Let's do a sword fight scene on top of a drill. Yeah. Because that's what people go to Star Trek for. No. Uh, that is whereas not. Next Generation, when there's a problem, they go to the conference room. They have a calm discussion. It's essentially a mini version of the movie Diner. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. Yes. Josh Snyder, uh, it has been an hour, just so you know. Uh, okay. You have barely scratched the surface. We will have to I have know. you back. Um, you'll have to listen to this. I've been meaning to get Gary um, Gary Anderson, Gary Johnson, get, whatever. Uh, he did uh, the Revolutionary War, and he literally spent the hour explaining the eight years before the Revolutionary War. And then I was like, <laughs> hey, we're at an hour. So I got to get him back, too. <laughs> so... Everybody's got to come back. But thank you so much for doing the Dork Forest. Everybody, it's at Nerdy Virgin on all the platforms. Flappers Comedy Club has virtual shows every night of the week. If you want to see stand-up comic comedy uh, anywhere in the world, it's just go to flapperscomedy.com and uh, follow them on Instagram and whatever. Can I do one more quick plug, too? Sure. Uh, so I, uh, I, re- I actually have an album out oh, on wow. iTunes. It's called Sketches in Quarantine. Um, and basically what I did is I recorded a bunch of sketches where I play all the characters just into my phone. Nice. Um, cause I, cause my thinking was any other time to release an album with no laughter would be horribly looked down upon, but <laughs> you've done a re- studio album, my friend. Yes. <laughs> uh, but if I release it now with no laughter, it was, well, it's because I thought I was going to die and I, <laughs> <laughs> I had to get these jokes out, you guys. <laughs> and uh, fair enough. Uh, so what's yes. it called? Sketches in Quarantine. Josh Schneider, Sketches in Quarantine. Go check it out if you have iTunes. And you do. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks for doing the show. Uh, Rangers, you know the rules out there. Take care of each other. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh, my God. We, why don't we just call that as the end of the show?